After Oregon State football laid an egg on the road against a now 4-6 and six Washington State team, and after they lost on the road yet again to Arizona, you may have put Oregon State in the back of your mind and thought to yourself, well, there goes their chances of pulling off what would be an epic spoiler in the final year of Pac-12 football. But that's not the case, because if Oregon State wins this game, and if they then proceed to waltz into Outson Stadium and come out with a win against their rival, the Oregon Ducks, in the Civil War, Oregon State will then be an automatic participant in the Pac-12 championship game, and it will come down to the Washington Huskies and the Oregon Ducks, and who between them has the tougher conference schedule, as to who would match up with the Beavers in the Pac-12 championship game. The Oregon State Beavers' playoff hopes may be dead. They are dead. But their Pac-12 championship game hopes are not dead. They are very much alive, depending on the outcome of Saturday. The Washington Huskies, meanwhile, they have national championship and college football playoff aspirations. But... They are coming off of games against USC and Utah that have been rather close for comfort. And Oregon State is better than both of those teams. And the Beavers with Jonathan Smith, with DJ Uyunglele, with Silas Bolden, with Damian Martinez, with an awesome elite NFL-level offensive line, they have an 11-1 record at home dating back to last season. And their only loss came to a Caleb Williams USC team that went 11-3, and and it was to a Caleb Williams who played better last year than this year, at least in my opinion. So there is a lot surrounding this game. There's a lot of implications, ramifications. There's a lot of rightful hype surrounding what should be a top-10 matchup in Corvallis. I have no clue as to why the college football playoff committee didn't put Oregon State in the top 10, but I digress. Their criteria is weird, busted, and they're a bunch of hypocrites. So welcome back to the show, fellow football fanatics. It's your host, College Football with Sam. Please like this video so we can get it into the algorithm. Welcome Washington to the Big Ten. College Football with Sam and our community is the best Big Ten football YouTube channel. So... We would love it if you could join us. And for Oregon State, I love Jonathan Smith. I love Oregon State football. I hope that they turn into a football powerhouse, despite not being with a now Power 4 conference, at least in the immediate future. I would love for Oregon State to join the Big Ten if it was possible. So please also hit that subscribe button and click the notification bell so that you can get notified when I post more college football and Big Ten football content. Comment your thoughts and analysis on this game down below, and check out my Patreon page via the link in my description and the link in the comment section below in my pinned comment, along with my merchandise store, if you want to support the channel. There will be a sale on my merchandise store, and there will be USC, UCLA, Washington, and Oregon colored t-shirts released at the conclusion of this season. We're trying to reach 20,000 subscribers by the conclusion of this season, and we have more than 10 paid Patreon members, some of whom get bonus content, others just want to give a small donation to the channel. Thank you for listening. But getting back to this game, I love these type of matchups. This isn't a Big Ten game between Penn State and Michigan or Penn State or Ohio State where you know that in all likelihood James Franklin is just going to give the game away to a team that already was the better team. And there you have it. Really, for the past two, really three seasons in hindsight, Michigan and Ohio State have had a firm grip on the conference. And if you take Michigan out of the equation beforehand, Ohio State has had a firm grip on the conference since about 2002 the year that I was born. That is how long Ohio State has been in the we are elite tier. In the SEC, Alabama has been that way since 2008, and occasionally LSU pops out of the hole, and Nick Saban plays whack-a-mole 
with every SEC team, and Kirby Smart has been this way recently as well. The last time that Georgia lost was nearly two years ago in the SEC championship game, and that is likely the next time that they will lose will be in the SEC championship game this season because they aren't losing to Tennessee, most likely, and they aren't losing to Georgia Tech. They may not even lose to Alabama. They may three-peat and go 15-0, which would be painful, I think, for the entire college football universe outside of Georgia fans and SEC fans who have totally given up on their team, so they'll root for Georgia to represent the conference. But this is different. The Pac-12 has typically had a type of toxic cannibalization that has taken over its conference really since the inception of the Pac-12, where only Oregon and Washington have reached the college football playoff every other year. The Pac-12 has not produced a team that, even by the end of the season, outside of maybe 2016 USC, was even worthy just from a power ranking standpoint of being a top six team or top 10 team that didn't make the playoff. Of course, 2016 Washington and 2014 Oregon were elite teams. Let's not get that wrong. But a top 10 matchup in the Pac-12 has been rare, especially in the regular season. And even though this isn't technically top 10, according to the college football playoff rankings, I have the Huskies at number five, I have the Oregon State Beavers at number 10, and other polls have the Oregon State Beavers in the top 10. Uh, The coaches poll has them 10th, the AP poll has them 11th, and the Huskies are unanimously number five in all of the polls. So according to some, this is a top 10 matchup. And from my own personal perspective, again, Oregon State, is, I think, the 10th best team in the country. Washington, I think, is the 5th best team in the country. And with a dominant win for either side here, they will rise in my rankings, perhaps far. If Washington wins this game by double digits in this tough of an environment and they control the game, they might jump back ahead of Georgia if they struggle against Tennessee. Potentially, they'll leapfrog Ohio State. Maybe they'll leapfrog leapfrog Oregon if they struggle against ASU like USC and Oregon have. If Oregon State wins this game, Washington will fall. Oregon State, even though they have an additional loss, I think would surpass them. I think Oregon State is a different team at home. I think Oregon State is suffering in a similar manner to how Minnesota in the Big Ten has suffered. The defense just hasn't panned out the way that I thought it would. And Oregon State and Minnesota both lost a ton on defense from last season, but they have good coordinators. And typically with good coordinators, you'll see a drop-off. But Oregon State's defense has collapsed compared to last year's defense. And Minnesota just allowed 49 to Purdue, and they allowed 52 to Michigan earlier in the season. Awesome. Um, Hold my beer. Let's see who can burn our secondary and burn our edge and interior players at a faster rate. But Washington's defense is nothing to boast about either. They're outside of the top 100 in pass defense, and their pass defense is so bad that it opens up the run on them. They have a really good front. In fact, I think they have an elite front, Washington does, but because of their secondary, their elite front has to be opened up. The defense has to be adjusted to try and maximize Washington's percentage chance of winning their games. And it really hurts the a defensive line that's good at getting after the quarterback, in my opinion, and good at limiting the run. Is it perfect? No. But this Washington team is well-rounded when healthy. Unfortunately, Cameron Davis suffered an injury. Their offensive line has suffered from injuries. Michael Penix Jr., ever since that Oregon game, when he suffered a minor injury, he has not been playing the exact same. He's still a Heisman candidate. Same with Bo Nix at Oregon. I think Jaden Daniels, and I'll make a video on this later this week, a short video, I think he should win the award, unless he totally implodes in his next few games. He is Kyler Murray, Lamar Jackson college statistics. It's nuts what he's doing. Both of these teams are great. I don't want to shy away from that. Washington's 10-0. and Oregon State is 8-2. and This game is being played in Reeser Stadium. 
so Oregon State is home field advantage. Washington's given a 52.4% chance to win per ESPN's FPI. If you look at ESPN's FPI and the raw numbers and assume that Oregon State's home field advantage is three points, this is literally dead center 50-50, a pick em. So I'm assuming for a variety of reasons or maybe through rounding Washington and Oregon State isn't a 50-50 game, that Reeser Stadium is viewed as less than a three-point advantage, which is about the average or a little above average maybe now with the new clock rules for home field advantage for any given team. 66% of you picked Washington to win, about 1,245. 34% of you picked Oregon State to win, about 645 of you. If you aren't subscribed to the channel and haven't liked this video, I'm going to remind you again because it'll help this video get into the algorithm. More Oregon State and Washington fans will join our awesome community and get the epic college football with Sam experience. And your vote matters. Remember in 2020 when everyone was saying you need to get out there and vote? Doesn't matter which candidate. That is the same message. The same message that I am delivering to you right now. It doesn't matter whether you pick Army to beat LSU and then LSU goes out and just blows out the other candidate, which since the Electoral College and states is winner takes all, I guess that analogy can make a little bit of sense. But anyway, um, your vote matters. It does. It's included in this video. So... And, and all videos, not just this one, but every preview and prediction that I do is including, it includes my community polls because I release a few days or at least a day, full 24 hours before I make preview and prediction videos, opinion polls to gather your thoughts on who you think is going to win the games that I want to talk about this week. So Subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can get notified when I release those posts. Like this video and watch more of my videos so that you can get those polls in your feed. Thank you very much. Both teams are top 20 in football power index. Oregon State, my potential power index, I mentioned last week it may not be out this week. It's definitely going to be out next week. I'm sorry for the delay. just want to make sure that it's good, it's set, and it's automated like how I want, and I'm having a wonderful, wonderful person sacrifice his time to help me. And I will reveal his name if he gives me permission in a video, or in multiple videos probably, in my preview and prediction videos next week, thanking him for helping me with my system. My system, power rankings, potential power, whatever you want to call it, last time I checked, about two, three weeks ago, when I last updated it, had both of these teams in the top 15. And for a long time, and to begin the season, Oregon State was inside of the top 10, and Washington was inside of the top 4. FPI isn't as high on them, and neither is the JP poll, and neither is S&P Plus is as high on these teams as I am. I have been very high on both of these teams for really the whole season. Even when Oregon State had puzzling losses and Washington had perplexing performances, I've been high on these teams. Washington was my preseason pick to win the Pac-12, to reach the college football playoff. I thought their sole loss in the regular season would come to Utah at home, and they would play but beat Oregon State in close fashion on the road. Utah has not been healthy all year. I think that's why Washington beat them. I think if Utah was healthy, they probably would have ended up beating Washington, but that's for hypotheticals, that's for an alternate history of football, and this channel is about the present, this is about previewing games, talking about the here and the now, maybe occasionally we'll talk about the past, but hypotheticals is good, there's a place for it, but that's more so for projections rather than looking on the past and talking about what-ifs, at least when it comes to the here and now when we're playing in the regular season. This is an absolute critical game. Oregon State was originally a one, maybe two-point underdog to open. They're a two-and-a-half-point favorite now. The majority of people, which is different from my community poll, most people 
are picking Oregon State to cover in terms of total bets on the spread. A fair amount of people, though, are picking Washington money line because Washington is an underdog, and understandably so with how they've been winning. And they've won close games on the road, like against USC, where they were a light, they were a very light favorite, and FPI thought that USC was going to win the game by a slim margin. And they've won. They've faced adversity. They've had three ranked wins, in fact. Beating USC, beating Oregon. They've beat Arizona before Arizona was ranked, but now Arizona's 7-3, and three, and Washington led them by double digits for much of that game. The Huskies are they're a good football team. They're an elite football team, near elite at minimum, I would say, even with some of their struggles. You cannot ignore that upside. And for Oregon State, it's a similar story. For Oregon State, there's a big story of what-ifs. Washington State caught fire against them. What if Cam Ward doesn't catch fire? Well, you can take that loss out of the equation. The loss to Arizona was just by a few points. It kind of reminded me, honestly, to make another Big Ten analogy, it reminded me of Nebraska versus Minnesota 2021, where Nebraska was always hanging around like Oregon State was with Arizona, but they could just never take that jump and leapfrog their opponent. Just take one of those losses, preferably the Washington State loss out of the equation, Oregon State's still in the playoff conversation. A 9-1 and Oregon State team, and if they were to win out and go 11-1 and and win the Pac-12 championship game with a 12-1 and record, they'd be a playoff lock with the schedule that they have. They would have had wins over Washington, over Oregon, they wouldn't have had that ugly loss to Washington State. They'd have a win over Utah, a dominant win at home, a blowout win, a few of them over San Jose State, Stanford, UC Davis. Those three, you may not think they're impressive, but when anyone, I don't care who you are, myself, the playoff committee, really anyone sees a team score 50 or 60 points and just crush their opponent, even if they're an FCS team, they're impressed because that's what the good, great, near elite and elite teams do. They crush lesser competition, no problem. It's the skeptical teams, the foes, the average and bad teams that might struggle consistently against lesser competition. Oregon State had a weird game on the road against Washington State, and Arizona is a team that right now is probably undersold because they're peaking right now, and early in the season, they weren't as good. They've gotten better since they've started Noah Fafita and after Jaden Delora's sad injury. Hopefully he recovers. Hopefully Cooper DeGene recovers. Hopefully any injured player recovers and gets healthy. And for Washington's running back, Cameron Davis, same goes to him. I hope that he's healthy and that next year he has a huge season. Speaking of Cameron Davis because he was a big part of Washington's running back room. He was going to be their running back number one. I think Washington's offense would look better with him as the starter. Washington, nonetheless, even with their injuries and bad performances, I think still outclasses Oregon State in most spots. I think Washington right now has the better offensive coordinator. I think Washington has the better strength and conditioning coach. Kalen DeBoer and Jonathan Smith, though, very close at head coach. For defensive coordinator, it's close as well. I think Oregon State, right now, with Trent Bray, I would pick him and the defensive staff over Washington's defensive staff, but it's very close given how both of the units have performed. Oregon State's defense has taken a step back and Washington's hasn't been impressive necessarily either. They have improved overall compared to last season. Washington's defense has. They were able to win the game against Arizona State, and they were able to come up clutch with some few turnovers and pressures against USC. They were able to limit many other offenses that they faced, able to get clutch fourth down stops on Oregon. Though you could also debate that was just Dan Lanning being incompetent and 
full of emotional chemicals instead of making good decisions. He claimed it was analytics, landing did and going for it and being aggressive. But I don't know. Part of me thinks that if it was really analytics and you realize that you can run on the Huskies, why wouldn't you have ran on the fourth and goal or ran even on the fourth down at the 50? You can run the ball. Just because Washington occasionally tackles you for loss doesn't mean you give up on the run on the fourth down. But who knows? Washington, if they win this game, they're locked up for the Pac-12 championship game, along with Oregon, I think. If Oregon State loses this game, even if they lose to, even if Oregon loses to the Beavers, I think the Ducks would still be that number two seed in the Pac-12 championship game. Because right now, you have Washington, who's undefeated. Arizona, technically, could be in the running. That's interesting. If Arizona wins out and Oregon State beats or that's that's interesting. I didn't even notice that. Arizona only has two conference losses, but I don't necessarily know how the tiebreakers work outside of, I think this is how they work. Whoever has the toughest conference schedule in terms of conference opponents, conference records, I think that determines a tiebreaker between three or more teams who haven't all played each other in, not in a round-robin way, but like three teams have a tiebreaker, but one team if one team has two head-to-head wins over the other teams they're tied with, well, then they go. But let's say Team A beat Team B, Team B beat Team C, and Team C beat Team A, where you kind of have that, you know, circular winning. You have that those circular wins or that table where one side is beating the side that's to the right or to the left of them, like a, a clockwise... I'm probably confusing everyone while I talk, but I think you get the point with the Team A, Team B, and Team C analogy. I think when that's the situation, or it's more than three teams, whoever has the toughest conference slate will then get the head-to-head and consequentially go to the Pac-12 championship game. So Washington, Oregon, Arizona, and Oregon State right now are in the race, But I would say Washington, Oregon, and Oregon State control their own destiny. Arizona needs a lot of chaos and a lot of help, in my opinion. When looking at both of these defenses, I got off on a little tangent talking about their odds to reach the Pac-12 championship game instead of their roster. My apologies. Oregon State's defense has gotten 36 sacks. It can pressure the quarterback. They have 41 passes deflected, 12 interceptions. And they have 10 forced fumbles. Washington, meanwhile, 13 sacks, 41 passes deflected, 11 interceptions, 3 forced fumbles, and a fumble recovery. Oregon State overall does have the better defense. I think a lot of that is due to the fact that their secondary is much superior to Washington's. They have similar passes deflected and interception numbers, but Washington is outside of the top 100. You heard that right. Outside of the top 100 in passing yards per game allowed. Washington's allowed 23.5 points per game. Oregon State has allowed 20.5 points per game. The Beavers score 37.9 points per game, and the Huskies score 41 and 41.0, so 41 flat points per game. I know that Oregon State has better sack numbers. I know that they overall have the better defense. However, I think that's because they have a large advantage at defensive back. I think that Washington's defensive line and linebacker core has the slightly better players, but there's an argument that Oregon State just overall has the better players at every position defensively. I like Oregon State's running backs. I love their offensive line, I think, along with Georgia and Oregon's. Those could compete for the best in the nation and should compete for the Joe Moore Award. For Washington, I give them the edge slightly at staff, quarterback, wide receiver, tight end, special teams, and then slightly at linebacker and defensive line. I think tight end, linebacker, and D-line are positions that are up for debate. So I think at max, Washington, who cannot debate for any of Oregon State's positions, can have a max of a seven-position advantage. 
Oregon State, I could see them having up to six position advantages. So overall, I think regardless, well, they could have seven too. Staff is debatable. So both of these teams, I think Washington is the higher ceiling. But I think that both of these teams have relatively equal floors on any given Saturday. I just think that the Huskies with their passing attack and more talented roster, deeper roster, I think have that higher ceiling. DJ Uyunglele, however, has been an efficient quarterback this season. He has 2,254 passing yards, 20 passing touchdowns, only four interceptions. He has a 158 passer rating. Him and Aiden Childs, the true freshman quarterback, have averaged over nine yards per pass attempt. Childs has 304 passing yards and four passing touchdowns. He also has 88 rushing yards and three rushing touchdowns. DJ Uyunglele has 153 rushing yards and six rushing touchdowns. Overall, the Beavers are averaging 5.4 yards per carry on the season. They have 1,969 rushing yards and 24 rushing touchdowns. The Washington Huskies are led by Michael Penix Jr. at quarterback, who has 3,533 passing yards, 28 passing touchdowns, 7 interceptions, and a 170.5 passer rating. So from a passer rating standpoint, these quarterbacks are pretty close Uyunglele is 11th in quarterback efficiency. Michael Penix is 5th in quarterback efficiency, but only about 2.5, 2.6 points separate them in QBR. So according to analytics, these quarterbacks are rather close, and I do find that interesting, but I would take Penix any day over DJ Uyunglele, unless in the case of Oregon State, you want to run an extremely run-heavy power offense, which suits him better than Penix. So both of these quarterbacks are built for their systems, and they have great offenses, and they're playing defenses that are below their offenses. So this game is going to be high scoring. It will be. It may not hit the over, just because both of these teams aren't necessarily extremely up-tempo. Washington, despite passing the ball a lot, more than they run the ball, actually choose a lot of the clock. They love to control games and try and rest their defense. Oregon State is similar. So this game may not be as high scoring as I think it will be. Just want to shoot that out there, but I think it will be a shootout. On the ground, the Huskies rush for 4.7 yards per carry. They have 1,259 rushing yards, and they have 22 rushing touchdowns. It's actually a higher average yard per carry number than the Michigan Wolverines, who are averaging 4.6 yards per carry. That, however, is because Dylan Johnson has faced a USC defense that is just gross. Pac-12 defenses aren't as good as Big Ten defenses, and that's going to be an adjustment that Kalen DeBoer, Dan Lanning, Lincoln Riley, and Chip Kelly, if he still has a job at UCLA, are going to have to adjust to. And they're also going to have to adjust to Big Ten weather, travel time. However, I'm curious to see how, especially with Oregon and USC and Washington, the more talented teams with more explosive offenses, I'm curious to see how they will handle these elite, quick-striking, explosive offenses, especially teams like Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Nebraska, who typically have good defenses, whether it's this year or the previous two seasons, but they don't have the elite athletes that Penn State, Michigan, and Ohio State do, so I could totally see them getting torched for some big plays. I look at these receiver rooms, Washington with Adunze, Polk, Bernard, McMillan, uh, Westover at tight end, take the cake, but for Oregon State, Anthony Gold and Silas Bolden are nothing to play around with, and Jack Velling, and Riley Sharp, that's a great tight end room. In fact, part of me is thinking that Oregon State should have the superior tight end room, and it was potentially a mistake for me to have Washington up there at tight end, but I really love Jack Westover, and he was great last year, great this year, and his backup has been solid as well. So I give Washington the advantage roster-wise. I think the players to watch are the two quarterbacks, Michael Penix Jr., and DJ Uyunglele. I think that whoever has the better quarterback play 
wins this game. And that might lead you to believe that I think Washington is just going to come out and destroy Oregon State. But remember something. Remember Oregon State's record at home, and remember the fact that they're not like Utah, where that stat was trotted out in favor of Utah, and I'm, I picked Oregon. I didn't pick them to blow out Utah, but I picked them to win in a close game, and I'm glad I picked them to win because Utah was handicapped offensively. Injuries at running back. Injuries at quarterback. Their defense has had to carry the load all season long, and they don't have Iowa's defense. And even if you had, let's say, Iowa with a slightly better offense at home, Oregon is such an elite team, such an efficient team, they still would have dominated them. Washington isn't as balanced as Oregon. They're not as talented. They're not as deep. I think right now they're better coached, and I think that's why Washington beat Oregon, is I think Kalen DeBoer is a more experienced, patient coach who knows what's best for his roster better than Lanning does. I think Lanning still has some learning to do, but I think Lanning is a great near-elite and future elite head coach. But I think that's why Washington beat Oregon. I think if you switch just the head coach, even keeping the same staffs together, Oregon probably beats Washington. I think Oregon straight up's the better team, and Dan Lanning is improving as a coach rather rapidly. But Washington isn't the same team as Oregon. Oregon's much more dominant. They're better at controlling games. Again, Washington, I think, is just better schemed, better coached. Oregon State, however, has an elite coaching staff. I think them and Washington have top 10 staffs nationally. And Oregon State is at home. They have the better rushing attack. They're close in terms of tight end and quarterback. Their defense is better. I think that Uyunglele has a shot to outduel Michael Penix Jr. here. And that may be a flukish situation. Maybe we look back on this game and say, wow, DJ Uyunglele was underrated and Penix was overrated. And maybe Penix, his Heisman campaign ends and dies in this game. Or I could also see Penix throw this for 500 yards and five touchdowns, given how suspect Oregon State's defense has looked, and the fact that Roma Dunze has 1,100 receiving yards and nine receiving touchdowns on the year. He's averaging 18.6 yards per reception, guys. That's nuts. On 59 receptions, you cannot cover him. Him and, him and Marvin Harrison Jr., you cannot cover. You can't stop them. Again, circling back to my earlier point, both of these offenses are going to score points on the defenses that they face. I think that Penix right now is the better quarterback. I think, however, that both of these both of these quarterbacks, both of these men, both of these awesome players, I think that they fit perfectly within their system. I think they do. I think DJ, DJ Uyunglele is better built than Penix for a power spread offense. I think Michael Penix Jr. is better built for an air raid than DJ Uyunglele. So both have great systems, great supporting casts, great coaching. Really what it comes down to is the matchup of these offenses against the opposing defenses, home field advantage, and other factors too, like the fact that Oregon State coming off of an easy win over Stanford. They're in wounded animal mode, and Washington right now is pretty fatigued. And I think in the first few minutes of this video, you may have thought that I was going to pick Washington to win rather handily, because yes, I do think they're the better team. Maybe in the past few seconds or minute, maybe that tune began to change. I don't know if you noticed that tune switch, but I think Oregon State is in prime position to win in a shootout. And I think that in this game, DJ Uyunglele will perform at a higher level and at a superior level to Michael Penix Jr. I think that he and his wide receiver core and his tight end room and his O-line and running back room match up far better against Washington's defense than a Washington offense that really passes to open up the run. That's why Washington, in a yards-per-carry basis, looks successful on the ground, because they pass so much that they have to use the run to keep defenses honest, 
and defenses don't prepare for Washington to run the football. Again, also circle back to the point that Washington literally got a freebie in terms of puffing up their offensive statistics against a USC defense that is the least efficient defense in all of college football, including FBS and FCS. I don't know how you can have that much talent and perform at that poor of a level. I'm glad Alex Grinch is gone. Same with Brian Ferentz. The Big Ten is going to have a lot of change when it comes to coordinators and some substantial change as well when it comes to head coaches. Nice to see that David Braun was promoted to be Northwestern's official head coach for the foreseeable future. I think Washington will pass for 400 or more yards, but I think Oregon State will be able to limit their ground game, and they will have one or more turnovers. The Huskies will lose their first game of the season, but if they win out with a loss against an Oregon State team that will either be 10-2, and 9-3, We'll have to see how they finish. Maybe they rematch them in the Pac-12 championship game. If Washington wins out after this loss, they're likely in the college football playoff because they will beat an Oregon team, likely, or an Oregon State team, who if Oregon State wins out and rematches Washington, will be in the top 10. They'll earn another top 10 win, and Corvallis is a tough place to play. That would have been laughable to say in recent memory, but now... It's true. This is Oregon State's chance to contend for the Pac-12 title. I think they're going to be motivated. They'll be in wounded animal mode, and I think they match up well with Washington. I think they'll have an easier time controlling the game and scoring on Washington's defense than the other way around. The Beavers also have the more efficient red zone offense, and I think that will help them win this football game. So I'm going with Oregon State 42 Washington 39 in a late night for us in Eastern Standard Time and Central Standard Time. Really a late afternoon game for those in Pacific Standard Time and Mountain West Standard Time, or Mountain Standard Time, rather. I'm going for a shootout win for Jonathan Smith and the Oregon State Beavers. Thank you very much for watching this video. I want to give a shout out to those who have supported this channel. Your support is always appreciated. However, it is never expected. Thanks to Crash2488, Anthony McDowell, and Justin Rogg for being Heisman Patreon sponsors. Thanks to Spencer Bringhurst, Noah DDLC, and SFS Inverted for being All-American Patreon supporters. And thanks to Will Loftus, Gabriel Callender, Roaming Gnome, Matthew Sale, Chris Lane, Austin Christmas, and Zubin Za for being All-Conference Patrons. Have a great day, guys, and I will see you all around. Bye-bye.